Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. On today's episode, ladies, we have Vivian Tu. She has over 1 million followers on TikTok, and what she's talking about is personal financial literacy. And we get into so many great topics on today's episode, real conversation, uh, everything from the importance of talking about money with your friends and what we're making and and all the things that go around that. We also get into really specific strategies around um, budgeting, but not in the traditional sense or not cutting everything back, but she gives a whole great method on how you can do budgeting in a way that works for you. One thing that she talks about is how we sabotage ourselves when we do see money on our bank account. And she shared a very good hack that you can apply today. So this is a very fun interview about such an important topic and you cannot miss this one. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show, where we are all about empowering women to live a financially free and balanced life. Right, Andressa? That is what we stand Mm -hmm. for, as I like to say. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So uh, we're really excited to have Vivian, uh, too, on our show. Vivian, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with the women in our community and our podcast and all the great things you're doing around financial literacy and abundance and just great stuff what you're doing. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, excited to jump in to Vivian, her story, and what she's doing right now. I love loving her TikTok videos. Uh, I am just, I think I've consumed tons of them. So I'm personally <laughs> loving it. Uh, but without further, without, before going there, we always like to get connected to all of you. We like to kind of get, go deep, but brief, as I always like to say, right, Andressa? Mm-hmm. So we like to share something coming up for us, a quick tip, strategy, lesson that we've gotten because we get them every day um, and share them with all of you. So, so Andressa, what is going on for you? Liz, I don't know if you remember, three years ago, I hosted a refugee family on one of my Airbnbs. Do you remember that? I do. And we we all kind of contributed, right? Or you you, yes. you put it out to the community and we all kind of yes. contributed different things. Yeah, exactly. Cool. We had to even like stop sending things because we already have like storage area. <laughs> Full yeah. of, uh, so we are very grateful for that. So I got, I, I still am in touch with the family, and I got an invitation because one of the daughters is getting married. So wow. I went to the wedding. Oh, that's so, so cool! I, I reconnected with with everybody, and they are always very, very grateful. Every single birthday, Christmas, they always send a card. But oh, I love it. That's not what I'm talking about now. <laughs> Something that happened in that wedding. Everything was wonderful. And I met wonderful people. You'd be very proud of me, Liz, me connecting. You with- interacted, you chatted yes. and interact with people. Good. Yes, I chatted with people. How cool is that? So <laughs> on my table, there were a uh, uh, older couple and we were chatting, uh, a, a guy, very um, successful entrepreneur. And we were we were chatting about business and different things. And then all of a sudden, he asked me this question. And I was like, what the hell? He said, "Uh, so your husband didn't come? Mm. And I could have said to him, I I am divorced. And ended the situation, the, the, the situation there. But I didn't want to do that. And I looked at him and he is very, very adorable, him and his wife. So there was no, you know, tension that I said, so you assumed I have one. He kind of like jumped back. It's like, (laughs) what? You don't have one? Like, why should I have one? Why all all the women here have husbands? How Mm. about if I'm gay? How about if I don't want to have one? How about whatever that situation might be? I'm divorced, (laughs) by the way. I get I will give this to you. But we are 2022. And and I think that we had this conversation on a a, uh, radio show that we recorded with Kim Kiyosaki about this, that the statistic of women staying in the marriage is 37% because they are financial dependent it uh, to, to the situation. So financial mm-hmm. literacy, it's beyond what we are talking here 
in terms of building wealth through real estate and cash flow. Financial literacy, it means you choose if you want to be in a relationship or not because you just love that person. You bring you know, each other's joy and mm-hmm. you can go on and on. But money should not be the reason for it. And I am like standing. So we have this long, great conversation because I think it's part of my job and I take it responsibility for that to start educating everybody that I come across with. Not from an eager perspective or, or anything like that, but I think we need to educate women. And that's why at InvestorCon, June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, we're going to start on 22nd with a happy <laughs> hour, but let's leave that. 23rd and 24th, we are focusing on financial literacy from, from investing in real estate to business strategies, to talking about money. It's very, very important. I was in a toxic toxic and abusive relationship, and I stay in that relationship because I was financial dependent. So we were really passionate about it. And Liz and I put the heart and soul into this event coming up, and we handpicked every single speaker coming through. So I, if you have not purchased your ticket yet, Get it, get it, make it work and be there June 23rd and 24th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Today, full event is going to be transformational in my my words. It will. I love it. Is that gentleman going to come, him and his wife? (laughs) He's so fun. They're fun. They invited me to their church. I was like, yeah, can I speak at your church? (laughs) Jesus. I unleashed my condition. That's my condition. I'll come to your church and I invite all the investor community to come to, but I got to speak. I love it. I love (laughs) you. I do love you. I do love you. Um, That's great. Without, without further ado, uh, Vivian, thank you so much again for being on our show. I really wanted to connect financial literacy, right? To, to all the work you're doing. So uh, Vivian has 1 million plus followers on TikTok. So excited to have you on today. Um, Love what you're doing. And we always like to kind of kick things off with what propelled you, uh, you know, to to create the content you're creating around financial literacy and the work you're doing now. So where did it begin for you? Yeah, I think everybody is looking for this incredible, amazing story where I wanted to help the world. And unfortunately, that wasn't exactly what happened. Um, I started my career on Wall Street. I was on a trading desk. So I knew my ropes around finance. And when I left the street and started my career in tech, all of my new colleagues were like, you're going to rebalance my 401k. You're going to tell me which health insurance plan to pick. And it made me laugh because some of the people who were asking me were, you know, married, had two children, lived in the suburbs. And I, at the time, was 24, single as a Pringle, without a single responsibility to my name. And (laughs) that obviously meant we had different financial needs. Uh, I started helping all of them out with their personal stuff, and they were all just egging me on to create this content for social media. I was very much like, guys, I'm busy, leave me alone. (laughs) And then when it was the end of 2020, I felt like I wanted to make a new year's resolution to start a little passion project. And you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? Uh, January 1st of 2021, I posted my very first TikTok, not thinking anything of it. I thought, you know, my seven coworkers are going to watch this. It's going to be fine. Great. Whatever. By the end of the week, I had a hundred thousand followers because that very first video went viral and I was not prepared. I started to have to create content more regularly, more meaningfully, but it has been a wild journey since then. (laughs) And I'm really, really grateful to have this platform to be able to help all of these people similar to my coworkers who needed that information. And Uh it's, 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 it's not surprising, but we don't, we, we should have learned a lot in school. I had two master's degree that I, the things that I'm learning, quote unquote, on the street or in the investment side of it, I did not learn. Um, and I pay a lot for, for, for all those years, <laughs> right? And I'm sure uh, people that are listening here can, can relate to that. 
um, school does not prepare us for different types of investments. So for the ladies that are listening right now, Liz and I always say when they come to us and say, oh, investing real, uh, where should I invest in real estate? We all always ask them, you got to start with 101. What is the, the status, the, the state of the union of your personal finance, right? Understand what's coming in and what's going on. So for that person, what would you recommend? How they can get their first, the pers- personal finance in check? Because many don't want to look at their bank account right now. So what would you recommend would be the f- first couple of steps? Yeah, touching upon your point, like our financial services industry has largely served audiences that are male and pale. And unfortunately for women, for people of color, for marginalized communities like the LGBTQ community, we haven't been given this education. This is information that's been passed down from rich dads to their rich sons. And these are conversations had on the golf course, at the country club. You are not having these conversations. And we as women in particular have been told that it's rude or impolite to ask people what they make, how much money they have, what they're paying for stuff. But the not having those conversations puts us in a worse spot than if we were able to benchmark ourselves essentially against our peers and get information and share that important knowledge. Uh, In terms of finding a great way to like judge your own barometer of personal finance, I would say my number one thing is before you even start thinking about investing, before you even start delving into real estate or planning for the future, have three to six months of living expenses saved in a high yield savings account. Reason being, a lot of us have debt, but not having this emergency fund means that if another emergency pops up, your car breaks down, your pipe above your apartment leaks, something happens, you will not be able to cover that and you will go deeper into debt, which essentially pulls you farther away from where you want to be financially. So I always recommend having that three to six months of living expenses saved before even thinking about anything else. Yeah, it's so important, right? And even now with everything happening, you know, cash will become, as the economy, you know, goes goes through what it's going through, interest rates going up and and lenders getting a little more tight with lending, even on on the side Mm -hmm. of real estate, it's going to become even more important, right? Cash and and the access yeah. to cash. So so it's always important, but certainly um, critical, right? When when you know, as they say, cash is king. I love that. So 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 for the folk for the folks, women listening, um, you know, they just want to jump in to investing, right? That's that's our mm-hmm. either they're starting out or they're scaling their portfolio, and a lot of us do it creatively, right? Creative financing. Um, you know, I know I saw rich dad uh, rich dad poor dad on your on your. Um, on your website and and creative financing is is a big strategy and it's and it's a great strategy but there's something about being able to manage your finances that you know is critical right <laughs> you know managing so when when they when they have that 3 to 6 month kind of like you know money aside um, what are just some best practices when it comes to managing money? Because I, I don't think we talk about that enough. Just the idea of managing what we have, right? It's not about, obviously, mm-hmm. we want to make more fine, creative ways to, to fund our deals. But if you can't manage it, whether it's creative money or it's your own money, it's gonna it, there's going to be a snowball effect. And I can speak personally about that. So just curious to get your thoughts on that in terms of actually the process of managing the money you have. Yeah, I have two big tips for money management, and I won't say the dreaded B word, budgeting. Um, (laughs) But I think first and foremost, something that I think people get really nervous about uh, with budgeting is they think I need to stick to this super strict outline. And if I do it wrong, I failed. That's why I prefer the 50-30-20 method. Um, with the 50, 30, 20 method, you'll find that you don't necessarily need to be exactly at those numbers, but it gives you a rough outline of where your money should be headed so that you have a surplus each month so that you're able to do what you want with it. So 50% of your money coming in, the cash flow coming in, you are going to spend on needs. This is keeping a roof over your head. This is buying groceries and potentially putting gas in your car. The 30% stands for wants. This is if you go out to eat at a restaurant. This is if you go get your nails done, if you go buy a new outfit, 
take yourself on vacation. And then 20% is uh, saving, paying down debt and investing. I think the 50, 30, 20 method makes it really easy. And even if your needs are only 45 and your wants are 25 and you are able to put 30% away for the saving debt and investing, you are still in a great place. You just want to roughly have those numbers. Uh, second piece, I think a lot of people struggle with visualization. A lot of us are visual learners. And a problem that I even run, ran into as a young person when I first started my full-time job was when I would see money in my bank account, I would feel this like false sense of comfort and I would treat myself. I'd mm. go out to that extra dinner. I'd go out to get drinks with friends. I'd get that extra Starbucks in the morning when I should have made it at home. And that's not to say you shouldn't have life's little luxuries, but a great way to prevent that type of mindset is to split up your direct deposit. A lot of us get paid via corporate employees and they have a work portal where you can select where your money goes. Most people deposit all of their paycheck into one account. I actually prefer to deposit the majority of my paycheck into one account and then set aside money for savings that just automatically goes elsewhere. I don't even look at it. I pretend like it didn't come in and then I never think about it again. But because mm -hmm. I don't think about it, the number I see on my banking app is smaller. So I don't feel that false sense of comfort so that I go and spend frivolously. I'm able to really build up my surplus and my you know, stockpile of cash without having to do much effort on my end. I really like this hack a lot. And I think that budgeting, it's like dieting, right? Mm -hmm. Then then you feel do you have, oh, I cannot eat sweets or I cannot eat whatever it is. And then the anxiety goes up and you're just like, I cannot live this way. So so um, what are the biggest mistakes that you see people making besides the one that you're, you're telling me right now that when people see money on that account, they spend it? Um, I see a lot of Starbucks, like they can have four stores uh, in the same you know, intersection and there will be lines and lines over there. <laughs> TikTok, it's full of, of recipes for Starbucks. I cannot even keep up with that. They sound delicious, but there's so many items. But the point that I'm saying to you is that how somebody can... Um, stop justifying, oh, I work very, very hard. I deserve that Starbucks coffee in the morning, right? And then at the end of the year, the amount that was spent there, it's outrageous many times, right? Considering the, the, the pricing. So how can you balance that, that out and you feel that you are rewarding yourself, but at the same time, you are, you are planning it? Is, it. is there like a mindset shift or besides the hack that you, you mentioned, how can we shift that mindset? So hot take, I am not anti-Starbucks. I'm not anti-latte, <laughs> anti-avocado toast. Uh, I, I, actually, I actually ran the numbers. And each year, I think if you had avocado toast once a week for brunch or like a latte every single day from Starbucks, it works out to be about $3,000 in total. Okay. Uh, $3,000 is a lot of money, but it's not so much money that, you know, people who've made those headlines saying, if you eat avocado toast, you can't afford a home. Like for <laughs> most people, that $3,000 is not the difference between whether or not they're going to be able to buy a home. Mm -hmm. That said, $3,000 is a brand new designer bag. And I'm not necessarily advocating for a designer bag, but that has inherent value. You can wear it. You can resell it for money. That $3,000 is also a vacation that you could treat yourself to somewhere really nice that you could actually find a lot of enjoyment out of. For the people who walk to Starbucks every day and that is their 15 minutes of happiness, great. Keep getting your Starbucks, no problem. But if your Starbucks is just an act of convenience and it wouldn't be that much more horrible for you to just make it at home, that Starbucks every year could lead to something else that you really do want, whether that be investing and having more money for your nest egg for that potential down payment. If it's even just taking yourself for a really nice shopping spree of items that you want, uh, 
it's just a way to visualize what can that $3,000 get you? Is that X, Y, Z more valuable than a coffee every day? I completely agree with you. My point, that being said, is that if they cannot manage $3,000, how would they be able to manage a higher mortgage payment or investment? So I don't know if there is a one-on-one crash course on, into to you know learning that besides on the street that can support the mindset around money because many many people and me including we we carry this money history from the past generations as you as you mentioned right for many people money it's a it's dirty only people that that choose money is that i prefer happiness let's say right so that is super important and i think that it's inherent to the point that people are not even aware of it and they are continuing the cycle what have you seen that has helped people breaking the cycle of of financial literacy i think wanting more and planning for your future is really really important and in addition to that is changing from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. So we as women have always been told we are overspenders. We love to go on shopping sprees. We max out those credit cards. And we have been told the way to create a surplus in the amount of money we have is to cut back. Don't buy that coffee. Don't buy that dress. Do nothing for yourself. Basically be miserable. Whereas our male, our male counterparts have been told to you know, grow your wealth, invest, be an entrepreneur. And their thought is to always make more money. And here's the big key that nobody ever tells you. And I live in a high cost of living city. I live in New York. And this is something that I really had to get through my head when I moved here. You can only save and invest as much as you earn. And that's if you don't eat, you don't live, you live under your parents' roof, you, you know, you pay your taxes and then every other dollar is for saving and investing. You can always make more money, but you can only save as much as you earn. If you are able to increase your top line, you will be better off than trying to cut costs in the middle to make that bottom line bigger. Makes total sense. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because it's like, I feel like, I feel like you're sitting in the kitchen of my husband and I as we talk, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's so true. Like, and it's so, it's at least my own, my own relationship, right. And, and, and knowing if you're a saver or a spender, I'm more of a saver and I've had to work through that where, you know, what's the value of my time and working through those, you know, pieces where my husband's more, well, let's just make more money. Right. And I'm more like, let's cut back. And that's a, literally a conversation we we have and we've navigated when we had no money, when we start to make money, when we, you know, it's like this whole continuum, right? Because you, you have a, you have a journey, right? As a, as a, as a, as a person, you don't just, uh, well, some people, you know, start their life rich, but I guess my, my question to you or my thought process to you is where, where have you seen the healthy conversations happen in the work that you have to do? Because this is deep stuff. This is not just, uh, try budgeting tool and you're good to go. And, and, you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot to this. There's a lot of emotion tied to it. There's a lot of upbringing tied to it. There's a lot of learn lessons we have to undo um, money and, and it, it w- equated love. I mean, there's a lot to this topic and I'm not certainly, you know, going to speak to all those things, but I'm just curious. I'm sure you've gotten those questions now as, as a thought leader, right. And just as like someone who, who's out there, you know, teaching about financial literacy, how do people have it with their kids? How do they have it with their partners, their families? And this is stuff that has to, and their friends. And Andres and I talk about money, obviously. And I love the friends I have that I can actually talk about that with, you know, and not be ashamed to talk about our, our net worth. Like it's like a dirty thing or, oh my God, we have a net worth, you know, <laughs> not that I'm broadcasting it, but I want to share it with a group of people who are going to have my back and support each other. Right. So how have you seen those conversations um, evolve, happen, be healthy? Because it's, I think that's really important part of all this. Yeah. So I'll give you my background and how I then approach it with my friends. Uh, I grew up in a home. My parents are Chinese immigrants. I grew up in a home where saving was a big topic. It's been woven into my DNA. You know, we were washing Ziploc bags, like my mom loved to save. I didn't really start thinking about how to grow my wealth and invest until I started my career on Wall Street. I was so, so fortunate on a team of 
30 white men. There was one other, there was only one other woman. She happened to be an Asian woman, um, you know, I think 15 ish years, my senior. So it wasn't like we were necessarily peers, but we developed a mentor mentee bond very, very quickly. She grew up not super rich, but was able to really propel herself forward through strong education, being a good student and eventually getting a very high level job where she was able to make a lot of money. And she was the one who pulled me aside and said, what are you putting into your 401k? And I said, my 401 what? (laughs) And I didn't know these things. It's not like we are taught these things in school. So she really helped round out my financial education aside from just the saving budgeting piece. She was the one that really focused in on investing and growing. I was so fortunate to have her as my mentor. She and I are still very, very close to this day, but she was also part of the impetus of why my brand is called Your Rich BFF. Uh, Backstory, I went to school with a very, very close-knit group of five best friends, and I was the dumbest friend in the group. They all went on to higher education. One of them's now a surgery resident. One of them's in law school, two in business school. And I graduated with my bachelor's degree, and I was like, whew, we are never (laughs) going back. I'm going to the workforce. I'm ready to make money. I'm ready to be rich. Um, So I get my fancy Wall Street job, and when my girlfriends visit me or I visit them, I knew they were six figures in the hole in terms of student debt. So I would pick up the dinner bill because I could afford it. And they would always joke, ha ha, I'm so lucky to have a rich best friend. Yeah. And <laughs> money great. conversations have historically been in corporate boardrooms, across desks, in incredibly stale, dry settings. Whereas your rich BFF, the hope and the mission is that we can talk about money Like we're two best friends who went out, hit the bar a little too hard last night. This morning, we're having Bloody Marys catching up at brunch. And we are talking about money and finance and net worth like we're talking about who kissed who last night. And it's just as fun. It's just as gossipy. Like, you know, we love to read tabloids and talk about pop culture. Why can't talking about money be just like that? I'll just give you my my two cents on that. I think it served a purpose, right? It maintained majority of the population very silent. It's Mm -hmm. a weapon. It's a weapon that have been used for years and years. So people are literally numb. They don't make the decisions. They don't stand for their rights. They don't even, it's not even a subject that they feel that they are entitled or knowledgeable to talk about. And I think that things are really, really shifting, especially Liz and I have talked to so, so many women and have connected with so many women across now 42 countries with, with our podcast. And our goal is to just spread the word that let's talk about it. We're not giving like step by step. Well, let's start this conversation. That's, that's the goal. Let's start this conversation. Let's look at ourselves and, and, and take the next step. How do you see it, Vivian, moving forward? Do you see, do you see some change as I as we are seeing on our end with the real estate or in different different types of investments uh, right now? With especially with with women, what have you seen with your your clients and the interactions that you had in your social media? Yeah, I think every generation is better than the last. I feel really fortunate that I have folks who literally just started investing during COVID. I think there was a lot of hype and hullabaloo around things like GameStop and AMC. And listen, I'm not advocating for investing in meme stocks, but I do think having the tabloids cover GameStop like it was, you know, Justin and Haley Bieber made finance accessible to young people who normally wouldn't necessarily have read those articles or normally wouldn't have necessarily sought out that information. That is, I think, my bread and butter audience, the next generation of people who want to invest, who want to grow their wealth, who are kind of sick of working their nine to five and looking at the numbers and feeling like they will never retire. 
I think the next generation wants better. They don't want to work these backbreaking long hours. They want to hit financial independence as soon as possible and then pursue whatever their own passions are. I find it so interesting that Gen Z is just like not afraid (laughs) of anything. Um, Mm -hmm. They like what they like. They hate what they don't. And they are unapologetically themselves. Whereas millennials, I think, felt a lot of influence from boomers and Gen X to conform to societal norms. Gen Z just does not feel that way. Mm -hmm. They are able, they are probably the most free thinking generation that we've ever had. And I hope it only continues to be that way. Well, let me, let me ask you, is there hope for the, for the millennials that are listening to us? How, what's happening? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Uh, I personally am also millennial, so no hate to the millennials, but I think Um, millennials could definitely take a book out of the Gen Z, uh, take a page out of the Gen Z playbook by being more bold. Ask your friends what they make, ask them what they're investing in, ask them what their mortgage rate was, who their lender was. Are they invested in crypto? What is their plan for the future? These are important conversations, just as important as what we're having for dinner on Tuesday. And I think it's really, really important that we feel more comfortable with them Because the more we compare, the more we know what we deserve. Yeah. Yeah. And and we've seen that. When Andres and I started, we started with a Facebook community that was virtual. And they were like, we got to do something in person. And so we started with our first meetup in, in Philadelphia. And the conversations we got in were, it was like a circle of women. And we were just talking about real estate and contractors and just all the stuff that her and I have been always talked about, but with other women, right? And we're like, this is important, you know, and and to ask the questions to your point. Um, and then and then to see it grow, right? We have 53 meetups across the country and and in Canada. Um, you know, people have asked us, why, why is there even a why is there even a need? you know, for, for a women's community, we've come a long way. Women have everything. Not sure why this is needed anymore. We've gotten that question numerous times. I have, Nadressa has. And, um, but I, I, what we do say, cause it's always an opportunity to grow and learn, right. Collectively, you know, you do say that it is incredibly important because it's a safe space for women to, to give and get the support that they need in, in the way they need it, you know, and have those conversations besides their neighbors or at the country club or at their supermarket. Like these are real conversations about money, about investing, and, and they're seeing other women do it. And it's like, wow, I can do this too. And this is how I can, and how I can do this. So um, to, to your point, the, the, the conversations with friends is always a little more harder, right? Because it's easy to go to a meetup that's called Invest Her and talk about money. It's a little easier, right? And that's what we're, what, that's the space we've created. But it's another step to then talk to the friend that you've known your whole life or, or talk to the family member, the, the mother or the father or the grandparent that literally has never talked about money. Liz, you, you just you start like this. How's your mashed potato? And this, how good. How about, how, the, how much do you make per year? Right. But it's interesting, right? And, and it's something we have to all be mindful of. I love talking about real estate and money, but I even find I'm in a, a, a mastermind and we showed our, our income and our expenses. We showed our net worth. I was so nervous to go over that with them. I didn't know if I was going to be judged. There's women in my group that probably t- t- 10 times what I have. There's other women that, that don't. And I felt bad about that. They're like, I'm going to feel bad about that. So you, you, these crazy thoughts, you know, and I'm like, maybe I'm the only crazy one. But if, if that was something we did, and we do that as a family now, we go through our income, our expenses. Um, we talk about the four buckets, invest, save, spend, give. Those are conversations my eight-year-old and five-year-old are having now, you know? And I'm like, so it's just important, right? And I think it's just a right on justice. Like a, it's an evolving thing. We have to keep talking about it in the way that that works. I think it's a little troublesome because in our culture we equate money as a proxy for success, which is why people feel so badly when they have more money than other people and sure. feel worse when they have less money than other people. To your point of like being mm-hmm. in the middle point of yeah. the mm-hmm. folks who attended that mastermind. But I'll flip it back to you. And this was a question I asked my audience and they all laughed and thought it was hilarious. I went to brunch with a girlfriend that I was very, very close with. And by very, very close, I mean, we lived together in college. She'd seen me naked, like, 
you know, she knew about that one time I got really horrible food poisoning and couldn't stop vomiting. Like she has seen me in some depths. Yeah. (laughs) What we make was where we drew the line. Like this person was the person who, before I could afford to go and get it professionally done was the person who would like bikini wax me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that's so funny. Like you've seen your friends naked and you know everything about your best friends. How come you don't know what they make? No, I totally get that. I totally get that Vivian. And I, when I think about my next thought, because Andres and I are leading this community of women and uh, young, old, you know, all the, all the various degrees. And what's interesting is what, what gets me thinking about it is almost creating like a process for women, creating like a, a way to, to initiate those conversations. So, so it feels safe. It feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. It feels like they can have it in a, uh, with ease versus like, boom, you know, I, that that's where my thought goes. And I think to, to do things that are different, especially as it comes to money and talking about these things, you could just be bold and ask the question, right? That's, that's obviously one way to do it. Um, and you can also just like create almost like a, that, that environment and then like kind of ease into it. I know for, for some women, they would probably appreciate that, but that's where my head immediately went when you said that of what's the process here. How can we create more of this conversation with friends and do more of that and be the, be the, be the, the bold one in the conversation, right? So the first, the first conversation is always going to be the hardest too, but say you ask your friend what they make and they say, Hey, I'm not like super comfortable answering that right now. The next person who asks them is going to chip away at that barrier a little bit more. The third person who asks them is going to chip away at that barrier. And the fourth person who asks them might get an answer. And they might even circle back to the first three people and ask, Hey, I I know we had kind of talked about this before, but like, what are you making? And then they might feel comfortable telling you. I think the more common, the more blase blase we make these conversations out to be like, it's no big deal. The easier they're going to get to be. I, I agree with you. Like looking back, I went to Disney with my best friend from Brazil, from high school. And we talk about how much we made, but we were like in the the ride or something. And I think that the the goal, the reason for it is because we are talking about lifestyle and time, Mm -hmm. right? So not necessarily how can I make more money by killing myself and just, you know, working uh, all day long, but how can I make whatever my goal is? by having the lifestyle that I want and time. I think uh, I am as rich as free time as I have. So Mm. I'm basing my success into free time, in peace, in ease, in development of different types of businesses, in creativity, in things like that. Yesterday I was freaking gardening at the end of the day because I chose to, because I need to, because I deserve it. I have the time. And the choice to do that. So we had this conversation and it's funny, right? And you mentioned this, Vivian, like people assume a lot of things from others. You might assume, oh my gosh, so-and-so might be making so much or so little or, or whatever assumption it is. And you start having conversations so you can have different types of baselines and possibilities. And I think that that is, that is, that is the purpose of it. You don't have to have like a schedule meeting in order to talk about money. But let, let's talk about it. Or let's yeah. talk about how much you're spending on your uh, the person cutting your grass. It could be a starter, I guess, like an appetizer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's easier to compare what we're spending on groceries, a housekeeper, to your point, like lawn care, than it is to be bold and say outright, what do you make every single year? I think you can also ease into conversations that are just more geographically specific. Mm. Um, So in New York, most people rent and everybody loves to go to each other's houses and be like, um, so I love this place. It's so beautiful. How much is your rent? And everybody asks this question and it can be somebody's brothers, cousins, coworkers, roommate, and it's com- a complete stranger. And people will answer that question because everybody knows rent in New York is too high. I think in places like LA where everybody has a car, having conversations about car costs is very normal. 
Mm -hmm. Think about what costs are incredibly specific to your area. Do you live in a very grassy place where people have large lots to your point, lawn care? What does that cost everybody? Yeah. I think ease into it that way and you will eventually get to what are you making every year? Yeah. And for investors that are listening, I think the conversations like we, we joke about people often asking how many doors do you own, but that doesn't really mean anything in terms of how much money you're making or passive income, quite honestly. Um, And I think the bigger question, right, for for the circles of women coming together, and I'm I'm speaking to all the meetup folks that are out there that are are in our meetups that are are in the circles that are having these conversations, you know, you know, what are you doing? How much are you making it passively? And how are you doing that? Because it's really a curiosity, right? Well, I own 10 doors and I'm now, it's, it's yielding this amount. How did you make that happen? Tell me more about that versus, how many doors do you own? Oh, that's awesome. Wow. I want to own a thousand units. Well, they might be making, you know, a thousand, who knows? So it, it's it's not relative. What we need to have is conversations that are relative. And in real estate, people earned income versus passive income. My son said to me the other day, he goes, I want to earn some money. I said, do you know how to earn money? Yeah. Yeah. Work for it. Work hard. I'm like, mm. that's true. What's another way? And we talked about it for five minutes. Like, no, just partially, partially, yeah, partially. He kept talking. I'm like, yes, that's true. That's true. That's in your DNA because I'm a hard worker, honey. But what's the biggest thing you would need to do to, to, to you don't just trade your time for money because, you know, here, I got to teach him some stuff here. And he goes, and then we got to it where he's like, oh, I said, adding value. What value are going to add to someone's life? That's how you make money. You're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Well, how would I add it? And then we start talking about that and brainstorming what he could do around the community to add value. But my point in saying that is that's a conversation, right? The, the value conversation. What value are you adding to earn this amount of money passively? That's a really great conversation that we can replicate versus doors and numbers. Uh, that's just, it's just all information, <laughs> you know? So I, th- I think that's a great, great point, even in our world of investing, where we all see ourselves a little more acclimated to talk about this stuff, but even, even our community probably can take it up a notch and start talking more about it. It's the- more mindful, I believe. I yeah, think that absolutely. that's what we are talking here, being mindful of those, those conversations it's huge. And, and taking it to the next level. I would I have to add- say, yeah. oh, sorry. No, no, go, no, go. I was going to say, I really love how you added that Follow up. I think when we ask our ask our friends questions about money, when they give us the number or the big thing that we've been waiting for, we we tense up, we freeze up. Mm. Don't freak out when they tell you the number. Ask them if that number is much higher than your number. Ask them how they made it. Yeah. What job title is that? What skills did you need? And then if you find out that their number is a lot lower, why don't you share what skills you were able to get and how you were able to negotiate a higher salary? So I think. To your point, it's really important to ask that follow-up question even more so than it is to be bold enough to ask the first one. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that for for the the real estate investors, that let's say you're asking somebody that have ten houses, what's their cash flow, and they give it to you, and then you compare with your that you have three houses and say, wait a minute. I am making more over here. What's going on here? And you can have not like a mine is better than yours, but let's let's have a conversation about which areas they can invest and vice versa, which strategies they, they are using in a way that we don't assume, we just don't assume that the the other person is uh, having the same financial, you know, the, the same numbers as, as as we do. And I think that that's how we grow. Yeah. I have to ask you too, Vivian, uh, a, a million plus, you know, v- you know, followers on TikTok. I just, and I've been doing more TikTok videos, which is a whole like new world, you know, but I'm, I'm just want to, I want to ask you the question, you know, what, what have you, like, how have you kept that up and grown to that kind of level? I just have to ask you selfishly, because there's a lot of women that are, that are on and listening to that, that are, that are doing more on TikTok. They know it's, you know, that this is a growing, a growing need. So any, any quick tips that you can share with us and the listeners about your uh, ability to grow so quickly in such a short amount of time? Yeah. So people ask me all the time what the secret sauce is yeah. <laughs> and I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, I th- as you guys all know, the TikTok algorithm changes relatively frequently. And for me, that means I need to continue to use that as a feedback loop of what content is working and what is not. 
uh, I batch create my content. So I'll write up seven different scripts and then film them all at one in all in one go, because I find that that's the most efficient use of my time. However, I do think there is value in also creating day of content that's very spur of the moment or breaking news or headline stuff. It's hard to say what works and what doesn't, because even though I have 1.2 million followers, it's not like every video of mine gets 1.2 million views. Uh, you know, I had a video yesterday get about half a million views. And two days before that, I got a video that got 10,000 views. So each video is a chance to learn of uh, what's working, what's not, what formats do my audience like, and what topics do they want me to talk about? So mm. I use that as a feedback loop. I try to batch create my content. And yeah. last but not least, I try to create content that I would want to watch. I find that we are often creating content in a way that we think other people want, whereas you'd be, sh you'd be surprised. People are more similar to you than you think. Create content for yourself. What is something that 10 years ago, five years ago, you would want? What would have been helpful? How, what 60 second video could have changed their life or made them make one decision that drastically altered their timeline or drastically altered their future for the better? That's, that's how I create my content. I love that. That's great stuff. It's great, great advice for all social media, quite honestly, is see what's working, tweak. You know, I love that. So uh, Vivian, where can the ladies listening learn more about you and follow you along your journey? All social media platforms. Awesome. You guys can will find all Vivian's links on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. The first one, Vivian, is what's the most transformational book you ever read? Oh, this is a hard one. Can I give you two? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I really, really loved um, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office by Lois P. Frankel. I think it is so important for us to acknowledge that we are the type of people who are overlooking, oh, like I'm going to bring brownies into the office and everybody's going to love me. No, don't do that. People are going to love you because you create great work, not because you are the office doormat. Mm. Um, I know this is a little cliche, but I really do love Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. It made me think deeply about how I wanted to be an outlier and what it would take for me to become an expert at something. Um, doing something for 10,000 hours, like you really, really need to become a true master. So I found those two books to be pretty transformative and I really, really loved them. Wonderful. And what is the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life, whatever balance means to you? So I think this answer might surprise a lot of people. Uh, I close out every single day with 30 minutes of TV with my partner. Uh, both of us work pretty long hours, pretty long days, and Work-life balance definitely blends. We're answering emails at 9 p.m. at night. Uh, we find it so relaxing to just snuggle on the couch for the last 30 minutes of the day before we go to bed because it's a nice bookend to the chaos and it helps me decompress before actually going to sleep. And I will add to that, like, I love, quote unquote, mindless shows. Those are no, my favorite. Same. I want to be able to, yes. Reality right? TV. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my mom was another day. She's like, what are you watching? I was like something. Oh, look at that. I have no idea what they're doing. They have some drama about whatever. It is just like mindless. I don't care type of deal. It's not going to make me think about anything, but just like being there entertained. I love that. The last question, Vivian, which woman famous or not has inspired you the most? I got to give a shout out to my mentor at JP Morgan. She was truly a transformational person in my life. Uh, not only was she the person who taught me how to get the best deals on designer clothes, she was also the person who taught me that investing in my personal life was really, really important and how I wanted to have a future that looked like hers. Yeah. Wonderful. Vivian, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for sharing your 
your wisdom. Love what you're doing. Keep it up. Keep uh, changing people's worlds through through financial literacy and all the good things you're doing. So thanks so much for sharing all of, uh, all of yourself today with us and our community. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. All Thank right. you, Vivian. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.